Okay, today is a very important lecture. I would suggest you pay a lot of attention and that if you have any friends that aren't here, tell them to watch this video. If they don't watch any other video, watch this video. And the reason why is that, uh, as I think I mentioned in, the, in one of my messages over the weekend, uh, your design of magazines and newspapers uh, will be worth altogether about 67% of your grade. By the time you, the, the, uh, as part of the final exam and your three uh, design projects, that's 67% of your grade. Therefore, if you screw that up, you've pretty much screwed up the class, right? And so you need to not screw that up. So today is uh, my first lecture in design, and it's, uh, it's going to be about as comprehensive as you're going to get during the, the semester about my philosophy of design. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, by the way, they, not all professors are going to agree on anything in this world. I do find that journalism professors are much more consistent than other professors, like English professors, as I've mentioned before. Um, I know uh, uh, Chen Song, Dr. Uh, Wang, met with some, some of the students and they complained about a couple of things like, Ah, they don't, all the teachers don't teach how to write the lead the same. Well, guess what? You're not going to have editors who believe the same way either. So that, that is part of life. If you, uh, if you want everybody in the world to agree on one thing, guess what? That's not going to happen. Uh, so that's not realistic. And it's also not realistic to expect everybody to teach a design exactly the same way. Now, I happen to think I'm right. Actually, everybody thinks they're right. Uh, I did some research. My, my research as a master's student was to examine how confident people were in their own opinions. And what I found is that, that when given three equally po possible choices, that everybody, that everybody who chose a choice thought they were 70% likely to be right. Now, it, it ranged a little bit from there. But in reality, it was impossible to guess the, uh, the, between the options that I gave them. And yet, they, and yet they were sure they were 70, in fact, it ranged from 70 to 80 percent, they thought they were right. And that included journalists and general reader, readers and, and a broad spectrum of people. They were sure that they were right, even though it was impossible to get to, to have one over the other. It was, they, the, the questions were phrased in such a way that there's no way they could possibly know. Um, and, and, and it didn't matter what they guessed. They were all still 70% sure that they were right, no matter what they guessed. And so uh, that's kind of the way people are. <laughs> we, we think we understand the world. And we think we can predict things uh, based on our, the theories that we have floating around our brain. Uh, and so people tend to be fairly self-confident that they're right. Uh, and guess what? You're all wrong. I'm right. Uh, that's kind of everybody's attitude. So you're not going to find consistency in this world at all. But you're going to, I mean, you might find a little bit of consistency here and there. Like I said, journalism is more consistent than English by a long ways. Uh, you'll, you know, English teachers do not have anywhere close to a philosophy of what's good writing as compared to journalists. But nonetheless, it doesn't mean that they're going that we're going to ha have exactly the same the, the same uh, ideas and philosophies. And if that's what you expect, you're expecting too much. Not going to happen. Um, for example, we were talking about leads, and I and uh, as I said, somebody in in the in this uh, uh, the group complained that we don't teach leads the same. And guess what? You're right. We don't. Um, and actually, when you get into the real world, probably nobody's going to use typologies with you anymore. They're going to write, tell you to write a good lead, write a lead that's more effective, write, punch it up, make your lead more interesting. They might say something like that. They're not going to say, oh, write a win lead, or write a cartridge lead, or write a blind lead. They're probably not going to use that vocabulary because, first off, they probably won't remember the names if they learn them. Uh, in, in the university. Not every textbook and professor teaches them the same, as, you, as somebody already noted. And so it's not going to be consistent, and they won't even expect it to be consistent. 
So if you start working for a, a newspaper, a magazine, or a TV station, whatever, they might t tell you to punch up the lead, but that's about as far as they're going to go. They might tell you the lead's too long, um, or they, you know, something like that. But they're not going to say, write a win lead. They're not going to write that. Uh, they're not going to say that. At least I've never heard it in my life. Uh, I have told my, my, uh, my reporters, you know, let's, we need to punch this up. And I may have demonstrated to them that this, okay, this is what we're going to do in order to make it more interesting. Now, one thing I would expect you to get out of my typologies aren't the, I'm going to make you learn the names for quizzes, but I'm never, not going to expect you to actually remember them in real life. Um, and you say, well, well, then why are you, why are you making us remember them for quizzes? Well, I have to make sure you read the darn text, that's why. Otherwise, the names of them, is irre that's irrelevant. But what I do try to do with the, with the leads is I try to, what I'm trying to show you with this is there's different ways of putting different elements of the story to the front of the lead. And what's at the front of the lead is, what's, is what people will remember the most. That's what catches their attention. And so if we're trying to catch people's attention, what do we want at the front of the lead? We want the most powerful element. And so the main purpose of this is to show you how to manipulate a lead, how to grammatically manipulate it to get any of the elements to the front that you want to get to the front. And so my typologies are different than other typologies, but my purpose is also different. My purpose is to show you how to get different elements to the front of the lead. So my typo in my typology, when I say a win lead, I'm saying get the win element at the start of the lead, where people will notice it first. And, and so the, what's in the front, you should better answer the question, ask the question, um, you know, when did this happen? And if, that, if it's answered in the first few words of the sentence, that means the win element has been put to the front, and therefore it's a win lead. If you look at a lead and you can ask yourself, where did it happen? And it's answered in the first few words of the lead, by my typologies, that's a where uh, lead. And, and same with each of the five Ws and, and, and H, that whatever's been pushed to the front of the lead, that's what I'm going to name that typology, that, that lead, because I'm trying to teach you that you can put anything to the front of the lead if you want to. There's different ways grammatically to get anything to the front of the lead if you think that's important. So you're, you're absolutely right that I teach leads a little bit differently than others because that's what I'm trying to teach you, that you can put anything to the front if you want to do it. And what you put to the front is a part that people notice first. That should be your whammy. Now, the truth is, very few people write a where lead. Very few, few people write a when lead. Very few people, uh, there's lots of leads they don't write very often, such as those. What leads are fairly common? Uh, who leads are very common? Too common, I think. I think who leads are much, much, much too common. In other words, people are starting their leads with the who element. And who element is almost never the most interesting element. And so I'm trying to teach you that let's put the, where, the who lead, let's put the who element to the end of it. Because that's not the most interesting element of hardly any lead in the world. Who is hardly ever the most interesting element. And so that's what I'm trying to teach you, is that I want you to be able to figure out how to put the most interesting element, the, wh the whammy, to the front of the lead and give it emphasis. That's what my purpose of, of my lead, uh, different leads are. Some of those others are like the contrast, interview, cartridge, interpretive. Those are a little more common, and they're, um, those are maybe a little more consistent in different textbooks. Not totally, though. Different textbooks will have them different. But those first, the first five in particular, which in this list is missing one, but the, five, the, the leads that start with the five, one of the five Ws, or H, uh, I'm, that's what I'm trying to show you, how to get any element that you want to get to the front of the lead to the front of the lead. Who, what, when, where, why, or how can go to the front of the lead. If it's the whammy. Don't put it there if it's not the whammy. I want the whammy to the front of the lead. That's what I'm teaching. And in that sense, it is different than anybody else's probably. Anybody else's. Um, and I don't apologize for that. And again, I don't care once you leave this class or leave the university, I don't care if you remember any of those names because no, your editors won't remember the names. The editors won't ever call them by name. 
they will say, punch it up, make it more powerful. And what I'm trying to teach you is how to punch it up, how to get any whammy to the front of the lead if you want to. That's what I'm trying to teach you. Okay. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit al already, the different types of, uh, of newspaper layouts. The one on the left is the broadsheet. The one in the center is one called a Berliner. And I don't think the Berliner is very common in America. I don't know if you have any Berliners here. I haven't noticed any offhand, but a Berliner is kind of a betweener, kind of a somewhere between a broadsheet and a tabloid. The last one is the tabloid. And the word tabloid is used in, in uh, two different ways. It's used one correctly, which is tabloid is the size of the paper. That's all it means. It's also used somewhat incorrectly in that, uh, that especially in America, we started talking about the tabloids as being the newspapers that practice yellow journalism and not good journalism because they were sold at their, they are sold at supermarkets and they always have to have very exciting headlines. And if you buy them and read them, you find out that the story really didn't support the headline, but they're trying to get you to buy it. And so that's their method of circulation is they're sitting there at the new, at the, uh, at the supermarket uh, checkout um, location and they want, they're gonna hype up the, he the headlines to a, an incredible degree to try to get you to, to buy them. So we sometimes use the word tabloids in a negative way, representing those newspapers that used to, that, that are sold in that way. Um, previously in America specifically, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in America, there were very few tabloids except those sold at the supermarkets in that way. Therefore, that's why we kind of just started referring to them. Those are the tabloids, can't trust them. Uh, but more and more newspapers are becoming tabloid for other reasons. Tabloid is much easier to carry with you and to read if you're on a, on a, uh, on a subway or on a train or something, commuting. And so uh, more newspapers are going tabloid to become more convenient uh, for their readers. And I personally think that's a very good idea to do that. Uh, I, I myself don't like to, uh, if, except in my home, sitting around my kitchen table or whatever, I don't wanna read a broadsheet. Uh, in, my, in my house, that's fine, I don't really care, but that I wouldn't mind if it was a tabloid either. I don't really care, it's convenient, I'll, I'll read any size newspaper. But if I'm going to step out of my home and onto a subway or whatever I'm happy to, to be traveling in, I don't want a broadsheet. And so more and more newspapers, and I think more will actually, since they're fighting for their life, more of them will begin going tabloid, recognizing that they are more convenient and people might buy them more likely if they were tabloid. But the, the uh, argument against it, which actually should be an argument for it, by the way, is that ads, they can't charge as much for ads because uh, the broadsheet is bigger, therefore you can charge more for a full page ad. And a lot of uh, grocery stores and people like that want to pay buy full page ads. However, a full page ad in a tabloid, in a sense, in a relative sense, is just as powerful as a, as a full page ad in a broadsheet because it's dominating an entire page. And you're, so you're here watch, looking at two pages, one with news in it, one with a full page ad. Whether it's a tabloid or a broadsheet really doesn't matter that much it's dominating half of what you can see with your eyes. And so for advertising purposes, I don't think a broadsheet, I think actually going to tabloid allows you to charge more for less space and actually ends up making the, it being better for the newspaper to go tabloid. But uh, uh, like I said, that's one, one of the reasons why they resist it is they think they can charge more money and make more money. And they're afraid that if they go tabloid, they'll lose some of their revenue. Um, so as part of this class, we're going to be doing a broadsheet and we're going to be doing a tabloid. We're not going to do a Berliner. We don't have time, among other things. We are going to also do a magazine, which we're going to define as an A4 sheet of paper, basically for our design purposes. Uh, a, lot of new, a lot of magazines are about that size, but magazines come in all sorts of sizes. But so do, by the way, so do uh, broadsheet and tabloid news, uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, they have all sorts of different sizes uh, of print. I can't remember if I, 
I don't think I showed you uh, in this class yet anyway, uh, my tour of the tour of my of the newspaper where I used to work. Uh, but they have to store tons and tons of, of paper and they're all done like a big giant roll of toilet paper, but they're, it's newsprint instead of toilet paper. But that's how they're fed into a press is their, their rolls and they roll them in and they're using uh, one, one roll of uh, paper for essentially every, every uh, pr uh, press unit. And they're printing out an entire newspaper, so they have lots of press units depending on whether you're a uh, medium-sized newspaper like the one I worked for, the New York Times. In fact, I've, actually I visited the New York Times uh, a few years ago and they have a, a print shop. Uh, it's kind of overwhelming. If, if you remember this, if you have watched the uh, uh, Raiders of the Last Ark original movie, it's kind of they go into this, uh, into this storage uh, uh, in this warehouse where they have all these secrets and everything, and it goes on and on and on and on. It's a huge facility. That's kind of what their, their uh, press room looks like. They have, I don't know, I, I, I didn't count them, or at least I don't remember if I counted them. They have not just one press. They have like 10 or 12 presses. And they probably also use presses at other parts of the country to print their newspaper. And that's why I said in class, uh, maybe not all the tutorials, but they actually, it costs so much to print newspapers and to deliver them that the New York Times could give all their readers a free iPad and pay for it in one year of not printing and not delivering their newspaper. So, you know, part of my theory of how, the, how to save the New York Times is turn off your presses and make people a deal that you'll give them an iPad if they'll subscribe to your your uh, uh, online version, and on their iPad, you have one button where your newspaper pops right up, and it's better than the printed version. Uh, and if they get them to sign up for a four-year subscription, like, uh, like uh, frankly, uh, a lot of uh, mobile phone or mobile uh, services give you a free phone if you sign up for a three- or four-year contract with their, with their uh, company. So it's kind of the same thing. Sign up for three or four years and we'll give you a free iPad. Uh, and they, they, they make them sign a contract that holds them to that. So they can actually be taken to court if they don't finish their contract. But it gives them three or four years to convince their readers that, is act that this online version really is better than the original version, if they have a philosophy for how to do that. So anyway, um, my point is, is that uh, printing is a very big deal, a very big part of a traditional newspaper. And uh, uh, they have to, even with the medium-sized newspaper I, I was working at, they had to store, they probably stored well, like something like 200 tons of paper at any one time so they would never run out. Because they were using 24 rolls, each roll was a half a ton, so they were using 12 tons of newspaper on the average day, and some days more than that. So if they're using 12 tons in a day, and they want to have uh, a newspaper to make sure somebody, if somebody doesn't deliver it, they have plenty of paper to keep going. Well, basically, if they're, again, they're using 12 tons in one day, seven days, they're using 100 ton, almost, not quite. Uh, no, I guess, yeah, it'd be very close. So 100 tons in a week of, of newspaper, you have to have a huge warehouse for all of that. Um, anyway, you can get different sizes of paper. And so some paper is, some broadsheets are a little bit smaller than other broadsheets. They used to be really wide. Um, and you'll notice they're getting smaller and smaller, uh, or at least I've noticed <laughs> at my age, that the, uh, that the uh, broadsheets are getting smaller and smaller, and they're still calling them broadsheets. Uh, same in tabloid, likewise. Uh, your tabloid would probably depend on what broadsheet size the newspaper is printing because a, a, a tabloid is exactly half of their broadsheet size. So if they decide they're gonna have a 27 inch uh, wide uh, broadsheet, uh, or well tall in their case, 27 inch tall, then when they move it sideways, then the, the broadsheet is gonna be 13 inches wide because they're, it's exactly half, it's being folded a different direction and being cut a differently. So um, we use those terms, but they're not exact numbers. For our purposes, our tabloid will be 1117, 11 inches by 17 inches. 
Um, I don't know what that comes out in centimeters. Um, but uh, anyway, so 1117 is, is, a, is one size of tabloid. The, uh, the bilingual newspaper that I, that I published for seven years was 14 inches uh, tall instead of 17 inches. Uh, so that's probably as much variation as, as I've seen, you know, 14 versus 17 in tabloid. And if you flipped it around, that would actually then be the difference in the width of a broadsheet. So one being, um, you know, a little bit wider than the other one. So just so you understand the terminology and uh, and what what it includes and what it does not include. So it's not an exact number either. Uh, we're seeing a lot of change in newspapers in that they're becoming more artistic, more uh, you know, nicer looking because they're competing with all the other media. So they're competing for their lives and one way of competing is let's make them look nicer. And uh, so you see a lot more graphics uh, such as shown up here, uh, big photos, uh, a little bit better design with uh, cutouts and so forth that uh, uh, you can wrap the story around and stuff to look a little more artistic and uh, um, the whole point is that you're Again, attend, you're, you're fighting for, for audience. Uh, audience is what you sell. Again, that's what you're selling for advertising. You're selling the attention of your audience. Uh, whatever medium you're at, that's what you're selling when you sell advertising. We're selling the attention of our audience. And so it's important that you uh, learn how to design in a way that's very pleasing. These are probably award-winning front pages, so I don't expect you to accomplish this in your uh, effort, but uh, maybe some of you will. Uh, we're seeing the redesign of a lot of newspapers. So the one on the right is the redesign of the same paper of the one on the left, so they were kind of experimenting with it. And, uh, and so you see the same photos, in, in essence, or a lot of the same photos, in the one on the right as the one on the left. The one on the left is fairly traditional. and. Uh, I would not be, um, well, there's a few things I would change with the one on the left. I, I don't think it uh, has what I would call the uh, magic uh, triangle or the golden triangle. Um, it, it has uh, a center of focus. That's good. And it's kind of center of focus is towards the top a little bit. Um, they do have a plugger up the upper left, that, uh, but you end up not really having a full triangle. You're not using enough graphics in the one on the left. Let me put it that way. It needs more graphic impact than that. One on the right, again, is actually, when you actually start looking at the newspapers uh, that have been designed, that the real world newspapers that have been design, designed since this book, uh, I think out of the 33 that somebody's gonna, that I assign somebody to review, and I'll review a few of them myself, I think one of them uh, more or less used the approach to the right kind of the approach to the right, and even didn't go as far as the one on the right. So even though they've, they've experimented with designs like the one on the right, very few newspapers actually use it, use it partly because it's harder to do. And newspapers uh, are always, newspaper employees are always in a hurry to get their paper out. And they always give preference to content more than, than the layout and design uh, and perhaps they're wrong in so doing, but that's the reality of it. Is uh, while the the front pages that I'm that uh, I've copied for you to, to compare, um, they're a few years old. This book is older than that. So they were talking about improving the design. Uh, this is probably more than ten years ago, uh, and they haven't really improved that much. They've improved a little. They're using more graphics, but. What, you're, what, what the reality is somewhere between the two. More graphics, but not all the way to the one to the right. You, you know, if somebody can, uh, wants to pull that off, that's fine. Here's another example, Kansas City Star, the before and after. Um, the one on the right actually is quite, would probably be considered pretty good layout. Excuse me, the one on the left. It is, uh, uh, has a, a golden triangle built into it. Um, uh, has a, a lot of graphics, uh, and so the one on the left would be considered a fairly good layout. One on the right is better, 
But again, you will not see in, in the 33 examples that I pulled out, any of them that look as nice as the one the rice. So uh, it'd be nice to come up with a design like that, but uh, most newspapers, they talk about it and they are getting better, but the one on the right is not, a, is not common. Let me put it that way. It's very uncommon to do that to nice of a layout. Not to say it's not better. It is better, but they're not doing it, just for your information. Uh, this is some, some inside front covers. Uh, like I said, uh, a lot of newspapers have more than one front page. Uh, each section has its own front page, and so even our medium-sized newspaper has four front pages, four sections, therefore four front pages, and this would be, these would be more or less what uh, you would expect in one of the, in our, what we call our feature section. Once a week, it'd be uh, kind of financial news, like the one in the center, uh, and then other weeks, it'd be more like one of the other ones. Uh, these are probably better, I don't know, these, sometimes you can, I actually think some newspapers are going overboard. They actually have so much art on them that, it, that you don't know where your eye, your eyes don't know where to go. And so that, that is, I think, one danger. Some of their layouts are very fancy, even the award-winning ones, but in reality, it's very, they're very confusing. With so much art, you don't know where to look. Uh, and so be a little bit careful in how you design. Um, I think you can go overboard by just throwing art, 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 we're gonna have something every place. And then what do you look at? So more inside pages here, some very nice looking ones. Uh, again, uh, emphasizing the art and building your uh, text uh, into the art or having the story elsewhere. Uh, the star is uh, even their front page is a little more magazine style, which is a little bit more like one of these. Uh, these are, um, again, award-winning. You don't see a lot of these, but these are examples of where we could go and where, where uh, even I, I think it'd be nice to go this way, but it's, it's hard to maintain this sort of layout uh, with the staffs we have, and we're actually cutting back copy editors along with everything else because of the falling revenues in newspapers in, in America anyway. Anyway, some more. Uh, well, this is uh, online. Actually, you're trying to, we're trying to, I think, that's what um, Yeah, so it's, uh, they're trying to get their online version to also uh, be more colorful and more attractive than uh, along with their offline version. Um, okay, so let's talk about some specifics now. As I mentioned, you know, you're going to start using these concepts almost immediately in designing your first project. And I mentioned in a, in a message I sent out over the weekend that where I'm going to flip the order, partly because of the order of the textbook and the way I've assigned your, your tutorial presentations. Um, we're going to be talking about newspapers before we get to magazines. Magazines are one of the last things the te textbook talks about. Now, if I had thought about it before, I might have done it the other, the other way and taught magazines sooner. Uh, but I don't know that it really matters that much which one we do first. So it was easier for me to keep your, your assignments where they're at and to change the order of the, uh, of the uh, major projects. So we're going to start with a with a broadsheet. Uh, so it's going to be a big layout, and your assignment will be to do a full full broadsheet uh, and just enough jump so that uh, I know you know how to jump stories from one page to another. That's that's a technical issue that you need to learn with Quark Express. How do I jump a story from page one to page two? Uh, so that's uh, you'll have less jump in this broadsheet addition than you would on a uh, on tabloid. Uh, in the tabloid assignment, you're going to end up doing two full pages. Um, and in this one, you do the broadsheet, and then you'll just do a, a little bit of jump on the second one, not a lot of design on the second page. Um, OK, getting down to uh, this, however, we're talking about uh, typefaces. I uh, want to make sure you understand the, the difference in, in, in typefaces and the one uh, here in the, uh, let me see if you're, let me see the mouse in here. Yeah. Okay, so 
the recorded version tracks it better. First off, in, in uh, sizes, well, I think that's another page where I'll explain that a little bit. Let's go down here to the, these, the type faces here, serif, sans serif. The upper uh, one is, is serif. The serif, the serif means the little crossbars that you have on the letters. So under the T, you see a little crossbar. Under the P, a little crossbar. On the top, on the T, a little descender from the, from the T. Uh, a little crossbar here in time. So, uh, serif, those are the serifs. The little crossbars are serifs. Sans serif means without serifs. So, you, when you start talking about Futura or Arial, is the one that most of us have in our computers nowadays, uh, or uh, uh, there's lots of different sans serifs and lots of different serifs. The most common in our computer right now is Arial for uh, sans serif and Times New Roman for serif. Uh, but you'll see lots, you have lots of other options as well. Um, this is important in that um, every newspaper decides also a style of layout. For my, I'm going to use the most common style of layout, and the most common is sans serif headlines. That's Arial, Helvetica, Futura. That's sans serif headlines and serif body text. That's the most common differentiation. It's not universal by any means. And an argument could be made that you should be consistent. I've had newspapers before because I wanted to look, in, indeed, futuristic, where everything was sans serif. No serifs. Everything sans serif. Everything looked more like the future, in my perspective, anyway. And so I've, I've designed newspapers where everything went, went uh, sans serif. Uh, I could also make an argument why everything should be serif. Uh, the argument for serif is that they've actually done studies and they, that by a fairly minimal state, people uh, read and recall better with serif type. Um, and the other argument with headlines is if you're going to have serif body text, why not be consistent as serif headlines? Why are you changing? Uh, typefaces between headlines and, and body text. Why not keep them the same uh, front? An argument can be made for that, and you'll see when you look at the 33 uh, front pages, and I'll, I'll put them on our, our Moodle site uh, here soon, uh, you can see that they all have different ideas on this. I don't think any of them have gone to all sans serif like I did, uh, but some do go all serif. Um, so that's important to know. You have different the type sizes. I will. There's another page that talks about type, how you measure a typeface, and I'll, oh, I guess one thing also to notice here is that your your the, the amount of space that you're going to use on a headline will depend on whether it's bold face, light face, italic. You know the the so within each typeface, serif or sans serif, you have these headlines take different amount of space. And so when you get the, the extra bold uh, or aerial black, they, in the aerial, they call it aerial black, that takes a heck of a lot more space than the, than the uh, uh, regular aerial, for example, uh, w without even putting bold on it. Just so aerial regular is much, much smaller, kind of in this case, it may be Futura, but same, same uh, Again, it's a sans serif type. So the regular Futura takes almost half as much space as the extra bold, which would be uh, comparable to the aerial uh, black. So you have to think about that when you're writing a headline in that I already mentioned it's hard to tell your story in five words. Well, it's, you know, you can get more words in there if you don't go black, but you're using black or the extra bold because it has more graphic impact. So you're also wrestling, what do I want? Do I want the graphic impact of a really bold headline or do I want to fit more words in here and still keep the, and keep the same size? Uh, you're, you're, as a designer, you're, and particularly as a copy editor who's doing, if somebody's hired just to be a designer, they don't have to worry about that. They're not writing the headlines. They're telling you, I'll put in a headline up here and I want it black. Uh, so you end up with four words because they want it so big and black that you only got four words. Um, 
and the designer doesn't, doesn't have to worry about it. The copy editor has to come up with a headline that can fit, you know, for, you know, tell the story in four words. Um, it's so, anyway, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's challenging. Here, uh, this shows how you measure the size of type. And so the size of type is from the uh, highest point down to the lowest point. Uh, a measurement is called points, uh, but you, you can uh, figure it out by, if you understand inches, which many of you do not, but if you were to look at it in the sense of inches, 72 point is one inch from here to here. Um, what, you know, so if it, not really, this is projected up. But if this were 72 points, it'd be one inch from the very highest point of the text down to the very lowest point. This would be called a descender. This is ascender. Ascender, descender. Um, so you, you have, uh, again, the type size is important, and you wrestle with the same question. Uh, do, can I go up to 72 point and make it more graphically powerful, or do I have to make it 36 point, only you know, half the size, uh, because I can't fit in, uh, you know, I can't fit the words in that I want to fit in. Uh, my rule is that you never, on the top of a page, you never go less than 36 point. That's the smallest you would go on the top of a page. Um, at least one of your headlines at the top of the page. You might have uh, one headline at 36 point and next to it uh, in a one column, you might have something smaller. But if you're going to go with a fairly wide headline uh, that it should be at least 36 point for graphic reasons. And so you don't want to make decisions uh, under 36 point is just not graphically powerful enough for the top of a page. Um, there's an exception to that and that is if the, ad, if the page is almost all advertising. So if you only have like a third of the page at the top uh, for your news and the rest is filled up with ads, well then that's not really a full page. It graphically it starts changing a little bit of what, what's a, a big enough headline if you don't have much space on that page. But for our purposes, we're not putting ads on the pages. Therefore, we're dealing with full pages. And on the full pages, you should never have less than a 36-point headline and preferably get bigger than that. You see, it also makes a difference, however. There's other things that make a difference. Um, I don't know the quark uses these terms, and even InDesign may have changed the terms a little bit. Um, but at least under the old page maker, they talked about set width and tracking. Uh, so they may use different terms now in Quark and even in InDesign, and PageMaker was the predecessor to InDesign. And I don't remember if they're using exactly the same terms anymore with InDesign even. But under PageMaker, they use these terms. Um, and so tracking, has nothing to do with uh, enlarging the, the size of the, of the letter. It's just giving more space between the letters. And this is a very tight tracking here. We did this, obviously not in the projection, but in the original. This is 24 point. So this is very loose tracking. This is, uh, so this is average tracking. This is loose tracking. This is very tight tracking. Uh, I would hesitate. I almost never play with tracking. But I don't think it looks good. That's not where I would do it. I would do it down here, under separate. Is that these all look fairly good. You haven't changed the tracking, and this, these are all 24 point also. But you set width means you make your, your letters even bigger and stronger. And you can do it just gradually, gradually, gradually. So this is your normal set width. Uh, this is really small set width where you, it's still the same point size, but you just made each letter uh, smaller and, and it's, and it's uh, the width of the of the uh, of each line in the, in the in the letter and so forth and this is very big set width uh, all the same point size so you actually could go 24 point and have a quite a powerful graphically powerful headline if you change your set width this much this looks like it this has the power of a 72 point headline even though it's only four, even though it's only 24 point because of the amount of set width they put on that so, um, again, it's been a while since I used uh, uh, Quark myself, and I'm just, uh, I, I finally, I got a trial uh, 
copy of it uh, last week and, and did some design for a book I'm uh, co-editing. Uh, but that's, uh, I didn't notice whether they, whether they have set width on that. I, I presume they do. But uh, there's also, oops, I missed it here. Also up the top, you can also have different spacing between the, the, uh, the rows of text. So you see the one at the top is very tight line spacing. Um, I wouldn't do that. It would be very, very rare that I would make line spacing as tight as it is, is in the upper example up here. Uh, but I, and the, the, I don't play with line spacing a lot. I might a little bit. But you see the top one is too tight. You have your ascender and descenders. They would touch each other if they're at the same, same place. We don't, we don't want letters touching each other. So we don't want line spacing so, so narrow. Typically, the line spacing is at least 10% bigger than the point size. So if you have 36 point headline, you're going to have something like if uh, you add 10% to that, that would be almost 40 point of, of line spacing. So line space 40 point, headline 36 point, adding about 10%. I've noticed some others, um, in, in fact, in design, uh, says its default is more like 20%. That seems a little bit much, but it looked okay, even at 20%. But if you get much beyond 20%, then you're getting too spacey on your lines. You're talking about, so you're talking about line spacing is important. Uh, you typically don't have to worry about it. In some cases, like InDesign, you may accidentally, without knowing your software very well, may accidentally make your, your line spacing the same as your as your point size, in which case your descender and ascenders will be touching each other. You don't want to do that. Uh, if they're the same, if it's 36 point uh, line spacing and 36 point headline, then you have the possibility of an ascender and descender touching each other. You don't want that. That's more that's like the top example up there. Don't want that. But the, auto, the, the default is to put in about 10, somewhere between 10 and 20%, depending on the, on the uh, desktop publishing software you're using. So you have a lot of variation here. Uh, the, the line spacing you can vary, the uh, uh, tracking you can vary, the set width you can vary. I would, again, my advice is don't mess with the, tra the, uh, the line spacing very much, very little, because it starts looking funny pretty fast. And I would not mess with the, uh, uh, the tracking very much. Uh, you have to have a pretty good design purpose and design to do that. And I have never actually in my whole career come up with a really good reason to change the tracking significantly. Uh, but the set width I've used a lot because there I can take a 20, I don't have much space and depth, but I can make a headline power, much more powerful by using the set width and making the, the lines of that of each letter bigger and thicker and bolder and stronger. So I can play with set width and get a, 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 the same, like I said, the same power of a 72 point out of a 36 point very easily by just doubling the, the, the width of each letter. Here are different uh, headlines, uh, types of, or strategies, whatever you want to call it, of headlining. Um, I'm just looking at the, the examples down below here. So the one in the uh, upper left uh, called uh, uh, the kicker. You don't see, kickers were very, very popular when I was young. And I think they're still a nice layout. I, I would not uh, uh, be opposed to using kickers. And in the kicker, you basically are using a subheadline above the headline, the regular headline. And it gives you a little extra space between this, this story and the story above it. And so that's not a bad thing. Uh, when you use, my rule is you don't, don't uh, leave extra space without a purpose. And so if you're lazy and you don't fill out the amount, the width of your space, and you have no purpose for not filling it out except you're lazy, you're going to get docked for that. I'm, I'm expecting you to fill the width of the headline space unless it's with a purpose. Now this one, uh, the, the main headline is filling the space. So that's the right way to do it. But the kicker by design does not fill space. 
you you don't fill the whole space. Uh, you you just make a very short little kicker and you leave some white space on purpose. That's okay. That's good. That's a good thing. That's on purpose. So don't leave white space without a purpose, but do leave white space sometimes with a purpose. And with kickers and subheadlines, sometimes you do uh, extra extra white space. Right uh, next to that that one, uh, you have just kind of the you flop it over the hammer. You see the, the headline is really big. This is where you might use a 36 or even a, more, a bigger than 100 point headline. Uh, you're not trying to tell the whole story with your, with your main headline in that one. You're trying to just get people's attention. And then your, your, your story is told in the subheadline. A subheadline, by the way, typically is one half the size of your headline. That's the norm, but it's not an exact science. It's not a rule, it's a norm. But it looks pretty good to have a subheadline about the half about half the size of the regular headline. By the way, the kicker is all, all capital here, that's not necessary. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, anyway, so this also looks good. Uh, I might go, I I I tend to go more than one word with my with a hammerhead uh, but um, actually you can go with your hammer you could use the same style and go the, the whole width or you can go half the width or you can just have one word like they have here there's not a set rule on what how how wide your hammer will be or how many words the hammer will be that's the, the dark one in the upper right uh, but the idea is to have a big contrast, use, uh, make something really big, and then have a, a, uh, a long uh, subheadline to tell the rest of the story. You don't expect to have a verb in a, in a, uh, uh, in a hammerhead. So you see there's no verb in the, in the main head of the hammer. Uh, but you have a verb in the subheadline. So you should have, definitely have a verb in the subheadline. So the headline here is hoopla. And then the subhead, uh, hula, hula hoops are sweeping the nation this summer. Uh, so um, you, you have your sweeping as your verb for your subheadline. So that you do want to do. You want to, if you, if you don't have a verb in the main headline, you definitely want to have one in the subheadline. You want a verb in there someplace. And, and the typically, again, the reason why you don't have a verb in the main headline is because you're using some sort of a hammer approach where uh, you're getting their attention with just a couple of words and you're telling the story with your subheadline and you have a pretty good sized subheadline. Uh, the down a, a, a row there on the left, uh, you have here, you had a hammer to the upper right, now you have a slammer. Uh, again, this, you, I don't actually use this variation the way it's showing it here. Uh, and I very rarely see with flammers, first off, I don't very often see a colon in it. It has a, uh, like a hammer type head and then it has a, the, a colon. Um, I almost never see anybody use the colon. So I would disagree with the authors of this. That's very, I don't even remember I've ever seen one. So I don't know why they're putting it in here, but I, I almost never see a colon. Uh, on, a, on a hammerhead like this with the slammer or with the tripod, either one. Now, and also, what I've seen more, much more of, is a, is a slammer with the uh, light face also smaller. So using this kind of like a a subhead line, and so it's maybe half the size. That's much more frequent than this. I'm not sure I've ever seen this in a newspaper. Um, but I'm not saying you, you can't do it. But one reason why I don't see a column there very often is that this this next this last part, the light face here, is typically half the size, and therefore there's no confusion. Uh, you have a hammer at the front, and then you have a half half plus size headline next to it, more or less. On this on the on the tripod, kind of like this, a smaller sub headline next to it. But in this case, they they have they've sized the. Uh, the uh, subhead line so they can fit two, one on top of the other. So this has to be about half the size. This might be, if this were uh, 72 point on the, uh, the, the hammer part of it, 
then this would have to be a little less than 36 because you have your line space. So this might be 30 point in here. So this might be 72, this might be 30 to, in order to get the, to make it uh, come out about the same, uh, line up the tops and line up the bottoms pretty much. So this might have to go down to 30 because of the line space. Um, so that's uh, the the uh, tripod to, is more common than the slammer and the slammer that's, that I've seen they've dropped the uh, size of the uh, of the light face part to the right and they and in, in either case I, I don't remember ever seeing a colon used that way in uh, in a headline so I don't know where the where the author got those um, nor, the norm with headline writing is that your headlines cover the entire story. And if they cover the entire story, then, then they, it, they, it doesn't get confusing. And especially if your story, if all your stories are modular, I mentioned the word modular before, modular means basically rectangular. If all of your story layouts are rectangular, um, then the, uh, and your headlines cover the stories, you don't need boxes, you don't need lines. Uh, a lot of the newspapers today will, you'll see, uh, again, when I show you the 33 front pages, you'll see a lot of them are using lots of lines. I think they're using way, 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 way too many lines. I don't like lines if they don't have a purpose. Um, I don't understand why anybody ever thought they looked good. Cause I, I don't, again, we all have our own opinions and my opinion is it looks stupid and it's extra work for no reason. Uh, as long as you're going modular, you don't need lines. I'd rather have the white space. And so, um, as long as your headlines cover the story and you're modular, there's no confusion as to what stories go with which, except when you have two headlines next to each other. And my rule is the same rule that uh, our design expert made for us at the, uh, at the daily I was at, and that is if you have two headlines next to each other, in other words, two stories next to each other, one of them has to be boxed. Whichever one, it doesn't matter, one of them has to be boxed. Um, and I'll get a little more into which one I would box later, but um, one of the stories has to be boxed if you have two stories next to each other. So there's absolutely no question visually as to whether they're one story, two stories, you know, what's getting them confused somehow. Um, again, I'll go into more detail later. So here, now, the, down, the bottom row, you see headlines that are not over the, over the uh, story. Um, so you're seeing uh, the one on the left is called a, a raw wrap, uh, and the one that, on the right uh, is a side saddle. But in both cases, the story, the main thing, the story, the headline's not covering the story. My rule with this would always box it. You never have a story like this without boxing the entire story. And so I'm not talking about the headline, the entire story should be boxed, so there's no confusion. The standard, again, is almost, I'd say 90% of all stories, the headline covers the story uh, in, in modern design. But once in a while, you might want to use one of these other styles. Uh, my preference of those bottom two, I would be more, again, go for the white space, and I'd do the one on the right. Um, so I would not use the uh, raw wrap very much. I would be more towards the side saddle headline, but uh, mm. but in either case, either case, I would be putting a box around it. I don't want any confusion. And when when you don't when your headline does not cover the the story, you have lots of potential for confusion. So box the whole thing. There's some rules as to headline sizes. And by the way, this, this is, I may have adjusted it slightly, but this, uh, well, the bottom part anyway, is kind of incorporated into my design critique sheet. And on the second page, it talks about uh, what size your headline should be, depending how, how many columns wide it is. Now, for our purposes, we're going to say that a broadsheet is six columns and a tabloid, you know, the whole broadsheet would typically be divided into six. There are exceptions to that. And in fact, you'll see as we look at different, uh, different newspapers, they mess with the widths of columns a lot. 
So you end up with, uh, because it's very easy to do with something like Quark Express or InDesign, you draw your box and you say, okay, I want you to put three columns into this box, this text box, or I want you to put two columns in it, whatever. So you can mess with the, the width of columns very easily with desktop publishing. Um, one thing I, some of my students have done that I don't like is they've made different widths on, di on, on the same story. They've had one column narrow, one column wide. I, I don't agree with that. Uh, but, but as far as within the design, even though I say the basic layout is six, would probably be six columns. If you were going to charge for advertising, that's how you would charge. You call it, you charge by column inches. So you base it on a six column format and how many inches deep it is or you add, if it's two columns wide, then it's two times however many inches deep it is, or three, they add it three columns wide, it's three times however many, how deep it is by inches. So we charge in advertising by column inches. So our advertisers, advertisers see it in six columns, uh, whereas uh, typically the, the tabloid is four columns. There are variations of that. Not every newspaper agrees. I've seen tabloids who have tried to fit in five columns, and they're very, very narrow columns. I don't like that. Um, but again, actually, when you get into the layout, you have lots of options. Just, I would not encourage you to get real narrow, narrow, and also don't go too wide. I've had students make stories where the columns have gone all the way, the whole width of the, of the paper. No, that's never going to happen. No, 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 never. Um, so you might have some columns that are as much as, or some text as much as two columns wide, but that's probably the most you'll ever see in a professional newspaper is, a, is text two columns wide, except when it's used uh, like a summary sentence below the headline or something, uh, then maybe you might see some variation of that. So, okay, so your headlines, headlining might uh, very a little bit depending on where you're at, top or bottom. And in the critique sheet, I don't try to do it as precisely as they're doing it here. Uh, but I do refer to top and bottom. So at the top, you know, you're going to want a larger size. Down the bottom, you'll be a little lower comparatively. But you, and, and you do not want you, want, you do want some variation in your headline. You do want some variation in your headline sizes. And the ones towards the top should be bigger than the ones at the bottom. That's one thing you should learn from this. Uh, and the one at the top should never be less than 36 point if it's a full page. Uh, and 36 is smallish. 36, I would uh, advise that I'd get up to at least 40 if I could. Uh, at, the, at the biggest headline towards the top. Get closer to 40 and go over that over 40 if you can. Um, so down here, what is what it's explaining down here. Uh, this is columns. Here, how many columns wide? And this tells you how many lines of headline you can have. So, uh, for example, number four up here, it's a one column uh, headline. So they've gone three lines. Okay, so this says here, it's a one column, you go to three to four lines. And do not do two, do not do one. That, that doesn't look good. And so if you do one or two, you're going to get docked. If you go five, you're going to get docked. You'll see some professional newspapers, including some of my own, where I've gone to five. But that's not normal, and it doesn't look as good. Three or four, for some reason, looks good. And so even though I've done five, in retrospect, I didn't like five. Five is too many lines in one column, so I wouldn't suggest it. Uh, you might do a subheadline in addition to your headline. So you make your main headline three to four, and then if you want to say more, use the subheadline below that. So. If you're in one column, uh, you're going to uh, do three to four. If you're two columns wide, and this is true, uh, they're suggesting this is true whether you're tabloid uh, or, uh, or broadsheet. And so I've kind of decided to agree with that. I've had to think about it a little bit, even last night, as I changed the critique sheet slightly. So I've never actually done, had my student do a broadsheet uh, in class before. I've always had them do tabloids, a little bit easier to handle. Um, but in this class, you are doing broadsheets, therefore we have to distinguish between tabloid being uh, four columns being, being our norm, uh, that's the maximum width, and the tabloid or the broadsheet being six columns wide, uh, the maximum. 
So in this chart, it's showing up to six columns, but five and six only relate to broadsheet. Four is the widest you'll get on a, on a tabloid, and that's what they're suggesting here. So um, again, when you get to two columns wide, something like that, now your headline can go uh, two to three lines deep of text, two to three if it's two columns wide. Once you get to three columns wide, something like that, now you can go, you can do one column, one line if you want to, but two lines would look graphically more powerful and you can say more with two lines in a three column. Well, once you get to four column, basically the full width of a tabloid, something like that, now we're saying that should always be one line for the main headline. But you could go with a, with a uh, kicker or with a sub headline uh, with that if you want to say more. And in fact, the norm is now that every, every story has a headline and a subheadline or a summary sentence. The summary sentence we'll look at again is kind of like a, a subheadline, but it's a complete sentence. It has a period. It's written like a, a regular sentence, sentence grammatically if it's a summary paragraph, and it's typically 14 point bold. Might be italic, might not be 14 point bold. So it's, it's bigger than your story, than your, your text. Your text is in a story, we're going to say for our style and our class, it's going to be 10 point for our text. The newspaper, the daily paper I worked at went down to nine point. They wanted to get more, more news in the paper, so they went to nine point. I think in one of my newspapers, I went up to 11 point. They didn't have as much news, but I also wanted, uh, wanted it to be easier to read. And I think that's when I went to, when I went to uh, sans serif body text, which is very rare. I also increased it slightly to 11 point, so it'd be easier to read. <clears throat> um, anyway, once you get to four columns wide, whether it's tabloid or, or broadsheet, only one line of main, main headline and then a subheadline is fine, uh, or the, the summary sentence. Again, the subheadline is typically about half the size of your main headline. If it gets bigger than half the size and it starts looking a little bit too dominant, uh, and if it gets smaller, it's starting to look more like a summary sentence. Um, and we'll go into more detail later. So that's important and that is on your critique sheet, more or less uh, how, how many lines of text you can have for a headline depending how wide uh, your headline is, how many columns wide. Uh, this is, uh, I think that I'm not sure the purpose of this was uh, was mostly to, to suggest uh, the, the importance of, of photos, but um, I'm also using it to to show how you might do a uh, a photo page, which we're not actually going to do that as part of this class. But if you had lots of photos, uh, you would not make them all the same size. So the same way that you don't want your headlines all the same size, neither do you want your photos on a page all the same size. You want one to dominate, you want others to be smaller, but you want variety. And so if you were doing a full size photo page, this would be something more or less this, what you would expect. A dominant main photo and then other photos, bigger and smaller, but variety in sizing. Uh, you want your, of course, your caption and you want a headline. Uh, if it were a, we're, again, we're not going to do a photo page in this class, um, but uh, just trying to get you to understand here that you want contrast, you want contrast in bold light, you want contrast in, in headline sizes, you want contrast in, uh, in your photo sizes. <clears throat> this suggests different croppings for your photos. You know, our, our, our uh, Typical photo comes out of our camera or our mobile phone, whatever, uh, pretty consistently what would be, we would call in inches, a four by six uh, inch photo. Um, we don't want our photos all to look like that in the newspaper. We want to have variety in the shapes of our photos. So I mentioned variety in the size of the photos. We also want variety in the shapes of the photos. So here you see photos that are that have been cropped in different ways to give a different uh, impact of them and to create some of that, that variety. So 
So you see one that's very horizontal, you see one that's very vertical, and you see one that's square. The, none of these are the way they come out of your camera, right? You don't, none of these come out naturally this, this way in your camera, therefore these are all cropped. And so as you think about uh, your layout, think about cropping. How could I crop a photo and make it look uh, different uh, than the typical four by six sort of photo? And so cropping becomes very important. Think cropping. I'm not gonna spend much time here, but in the old days, and maybe there are some news, newspapers in the world that still do this, uh, the book suggests that this is sometimes done by the news editor and they hand, the, hand a layout sheet like this to a copy editor. I'm not aware that that's still done anywhere. Uh, maybe if you have a specialized design editor, he might do something like this uh, and hand off to a copy editor to actually do it on desktop publishing. You might have this, um, but the layout on the, on the the big layout here is the way we used to have to do it, in, in de especially in this sort of uh, uh, detail, in that we had to tell them exactly what size uh, photos we wanted, exactly where the story was to flow, flow. and uh, this all had to be done in the old days, had to be done by the back shop. I mentioned this before, that the way that the headlines would come out in one long piece of uh, photosensitive paper like that. You'd have to cut them and put them into lines and make them fit under your, on your newspaper, on your, uh, uh, your actual final uh, news page. The same with the text, the text would come out in one long strip. And so the back shop would cut it and make it fit into the, uh, uh, onto the page. They would put, they had a hot wax machine. They'd put hot wax in the back of all this all the text and the headlines and everything and the photos, the halftone photos, and they would produce a page that looked like the final, what they would want it to look like. Um, and the editors would come back and double check that they were doing it uh, correctly, that everything was uh, uh, right, and the editors might have to tell them if the story was too long, the editors would come down and tell them where to cut the story because uh, they didn't want the back shop people are not necessarily good editors. Uh, they haven't been hired for that reason. And so, uh, uh, again, somebody from the new staff would go help them uh, decide where to cut stuff because it was not an exact science. We had formulas to try to figure out approximately uh, how many lines of text would fit into an inch, therefore how much would fit into 13 inches or 14 inches of, of, uh, of story. And we had to calculate the whole thing out and try to make it fit. Uh, and we would just draw it up, the back shop would create it. Of course, in desktop publishing, that's what we no longer have to do. Now we create it ourselves in desktop publishing. We know exactly where the story is going to, and we, we cut the story ourselves or jump it, whatever we're gonna do with it. We have, make that decision uh, as copy editors uh, while we're doing it in desktop publishing. There, there is no back shop anymore. If, well, once a newspaper goes all electronic, there is basically no back shop. There's no need for anybody to be doing anything outside the computer, and the computer goes straight to the plate maker, which goes then to the, to the uh, press. So there is no back shop, um, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Again, this is another photo page, or well, two of them side by side. Again, this is to show why, you know, the, the difference of using contrast in, in photo sizes. Uh, the one on the right is far more powerful than the one on the left because the one on the left, uh, there, there hasn't been very much cropping done in those photos. And so they all are pretty much the same size, the one on the left. Uh, there's a little bit of variation, but not very much. Uh, there's, therefore, it, it doesn't, it's not very graphically appealing. So whether it's a photo page or a, uh, or a news page, we want some contrast. And uh, the one on the right creates that contrast. They also have put the headline so it overlaps into the photo, some of that stuff that we were seeing in some of the new designs they were they're doing with the one on the right that you didn't have in the old days. So I uh, think contrast. Okay, page layout. Um, 
this is showing you some bad layout, some bad design, and some good design, and uh, why why it's considered bad or good. Um, okay, I'm going to wander over here uh, so I can point a little better. Because my mouse is not doesn't seem to be showing up. Shows up in mine, but not, and it will show up in the video version of me, but I don't see it up here. Um, Anyway, the upper, among the upper two, just comparing two at a time, uh, the, the uh, upper left has no contrast, basically. There's two, two uh, in fact, if anything, the photo in the lower left, it may be slightly bigger than the one in the upper right. So there's no focus, there's no center of focus. Uh, one on the left, you'd get a bad grade for that uh, because it, it's not, the general idea is to attract people's attention to the top and then with graphic, get their eyes to move back and forth across the page. You want to have some graphics in every quadrant. If you draw a line all straight down the middle and straight across the middle uh, width-wise, you have four quadrants. You want a graphic to be somewhere in each, each of those quadrants. Now, it might be one photo, like the, uh, you can do it with three photos. So you have one photo that dominates the upper left, and then another one that kind of splits quadrant, uh, the upper right quadrant and the lower right, lower right quadrant. You can have one kind of in the center there. And then you have another one in the lower left that creates a golden triangle. Uh, so, and you do it in such a way that there's some photo, some graphic, or at least some piece of graphic in all four quadrants of your newspaper. You want your eyes going, you want the audience eyes going back and forth across that page. Uh, you don't want to leave a dead space and you don't want any space on, the, on a page looking too gray. Gray meaning lots of type and no, no, no graphic at all. You don't want any place on your page to look too gray. And so uh, headlines make things not gray. Photos are the main thing in a newspaper that make things not gray. Subheadlines are also graphics. Uh, the uh, blurbs and things that I'll show you how to do as we get into desktop publishing help break up the gray. Um, you can use half column photos like mug shots and can go half column and let the text wrap around it. And so there's lots of little things that you can do to put graphics in, in every part. So there, but typically, and this is not universal, not every design will have it, but typically you want three, I would use three photos and most of my, especially in a broadsheet. Tabloid, maybe not always. Um, especially a small tabloid, like the bilingual paper I did was, like I say, only, I don't think I think it was even 14 inches tall. It was very small. So by the time I put in my flag and, and uh, two photos, I pretty much filled the thing. I tried to get three photos in, but it was a very small tabloid. It's almost more of a magazine than it was a newspaper. And in new, magazines, you'll never, it's almost impossible to use the Golden Triangle in magazines uh, because of their size. But uh, with broadsheet, definitely you need, you should be trying to get the, the golden triangle. So anyway, again, looking at the, the one on the upper left, uh, just you have a golden triangle in theory, kind of a golden triangle, but the photos are all, they're not enough contrast and the biggest photo, there's no center of focus towards the top. If anything, your eyes will go to the lower left and they might never go back to, up to the top again. So you don't want that to happen. One on the right, upper right, you have a big center focus towards the top. Uh, you have a photo. You have a photo um, to the right, then, and then you have a, a, a slightly bigger photo, actually, to the lower left. You have a golden triangle there. Uh, you have your eyes going back and forth across all four quadrants of the page. So that's good. Um, the second set. Uh, the problem with the uh, second set is that you have all your art kind of grouped. And again, you don't really have a golden triangle with the second set uh, because uh, the photos are on the, on the left side, the weak side, uh, you're, you have your photos too close together. So you do have a, a large photo to the top, that's a good thing, but then after that, everything's too, too tight. Uh, you have the two photos close to each other at the top, you have three photos close to each other in the bottom, so you don't have the eyes going back and forth. You've got them kind of grouped in two spots. Not good. Uh, the one on the right, you have your, all your photos dispersed. 
you do your center of focus uh, is not at the very top. It doesn't have to be at the very top, but you want it to be towards the top. And so the the uh, the in the center two two among the center two, the one on the right is better. Um, <clears throat> you do have uh, even more than a golden triangle because you have uh, you have uh, more art on that page, so it's even more than a golden. But definitely you have art in all four quadrants. Your eyes are going to be going back and forth towards the art, which is a good thing. In the bottom set, um, there's not a lot of difference in the bottom set. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit, uh, in this case, you have a very big picture of the top and a fairly good size of the bottom, so you don't, uh, you don't have a golden triangle, but you, uh, you have large art, and that sometimes replaces the golden triangle if you have large pieces of art. I would still try to put some art elsewhere. And I said there's lots of ways to put graphic impact that isn't even necessarily even photos, like a pull-out quote, a blurb. There's different things you can do to keep the eyes going back and forth and it not even be a photo necessarily. Um, the main thing, the... I mean, I don't particularly, I'm not particularly in love with either one in the lower, among the lower two. But they've done two things that are important. Uh, one is, uh, here they've used the photo to separate these two stories. Uh, I would box this one, the one with the art in it is the one I would box, uh, and then let this one not have a box. When I put a box here, it also does, the headline does not go across the whole, whole story either. So this is uh, two reasons why I would box it. It looks better with the photo to put the box around the photo, then to put the photo and then put a box here. You have kind of side-by-side -side graphics. The box is a graphic, and the photo next to it doesn't look as good. So this one, to me, would clearly, I would box this one. However, you have the same thing. One reason I don't like it is you have the same thing up here. You have a headline separated by a photo, and they've already boxed this one. I would not use these in the same page. I would not use, I mean, this, this and this are almost exactly the same design. I would not put the same design on the top and the bottom of that page. So I don't like that layout either. Even the one they, they say is good, I don't think is good. I would not do it this way. Um, if I'm going to use it at the top, then I would do something different down here altogether, like maybe uh, uh, a, maybe have this a one column story and jump it if I had to, one column and have this one be a three column uh, with the headlight over it. Um, but I would not use a, a, uh, a raw wrap like this on two stories on the same page. I never use raw wrap with two stories on the same page. Now that, that complicates your design and, and uh, kind of handcuffs you. I would not do it. So I don't even like the one on the lower right, but it is better than the one on the lower left, uh, but it's not good. This. Even though it's one line and two lines, this is uh, called tombstoning. When you have one headline right next to the other headline without a box, you don't want a tombstone. And so, again, they've, they've separated, they have avoided a tombstone up here with a box, but now in both cases they've set up a situation where they don't have a tombstone, so that's good, uh, but they still have put themselves in a situation where it can be visually a little bit confusing I would not, I would not use a raw wrap on, on twice on the same page ever. Would not do it. So here's an example. We're going to look at several uh, examples of the same page with different layouts, same content but different but different layouts. So it's important for you to understand what I like and don't like. And I'm actually going to disagree with the book on this also, by the way, on the next page particularly. I do think this is the best layout. Uh, there's there's uh, this one, and then the next page shows six of them here. So altogether, there's, uh, there's seven possibilities. And out of all of them, this is my, my preference. The one that they made big, I agree, this is the best one. Um, you have a big piece of art uh, towards the top. You have another piece of art above that and then another good sized piece of art towards the bottom. You have a pretty good golden triangle here. 
uh, with big enough art that it, uh, especially that middle art, it really dominates that page, gives you a good center of focus, nice piece of art. Um, you have avoided headlines next to each other in this one. Um, so there's no tombstoning on the page at all. That's good. So out of all of these, and I've lettered these, by the way, by my order, they've put them in their order, and I've, I've, had, I've lettered them. The, the letter A means that's my number one out of these seven. And you should study this page, by the way. This might show up in a, in a quiz. Uh, pretty sure it might show up in a quiz because this is uh, a good example of, of different ways of designing the same page, basically. So on this one... Uh, they're saying, uh, frankly, I covered it up, I guess, but they're saying that uh, the one on the left is bad, the one in the center is a little better, and the one on the right is, is, is the best of the top three. And then they've done the same thing with the bottom three. Uh, I obviously disagree with them. Um, first off, my second one is cleared out in the, in the lower right. That is one of their, their two better... That is one they said is good, so we agree that it's good. Uh, but I disagree that the one in the left is worse than the one in the center at the top, for example. And I'll tell why. I'll tell you why. Now I'll tell you why they they think it's uh, the one in the center is worse. Um, the reason why they like they think the one in the center is is uh, excuse me. The one, the one, the reason why they think the one on the left is worse, they've made it based it totally on the fact that we have these two one one uh, these two one column stories next to each other, and yet they're not exactly next to. I mean, they, they they're in side by side columns, but the headline of one is, is higher than the headline of the other one, so they're not exactly they're not tombstoning. Uh, and so while I I agree that this is not the best. I actually think this it has a golden triangle with it. Uh, there aren't, there is no tube stoning, and so I think this is actually one of the top three. Uh, that it definitely is better than one in the center. One in the center, you suddenly have two pieces of art right next to each other. So you've gotten the two stories away from each other that are one column stories, uh, and so they like that. They have one story on the left, one on the right. There are, there's no side by side stories. But they have art side by side. And I think, and they, so they've disrupted the gold triangle. So personally, I think this one in the center that they call better than the one on the left, I think is one of the worst ones. Because they, they you have a big gray area in the center. Uh, so you gray, gray, gray in the center. Two pieces of art next to each other in the upper left. I do not like this at all. So this is, to me, the uh, third worst <laughs> uh, layout. Uh, the one on the right, I don't think is, uh, is also not necessarily better than one on the far left. I, I think it's a little bit worse. In that, again, you have the two pieces of art next to each other. Uh, you have uh, solved this problem. You don't have too much gray here. You've brought this art, this uh, second piece of art up a little bit. So you don't have this big gray area here, which makes this one of the worst ones in the uh, center of the of E, right that way. You've got, you, he's, in the one on the right, you've done away with the big gray area in the center. Uh, so that makes it better, but you still have the problem of two pieces of art next to each other, no golden triangle. Um, I do not think that the one that I've labeled D is much better than the one that I've labeled C, that they consider the worst one. On that in that in that uh, row, uh, and I think uh, E is the worst one in the, among those three. E, the one in the center is the very worst one. Down at the bottom, you have two very bad ones at the at the uh, on the uh, F and G are the very worst of all of them, in my book. I don't think the F is much better than one. The G is by first is by far the worst of the worst, because now you have three pieces of art next to each other. You have the big piece of art, you have a smaller piece of art above it, and the smallest piece of art up in the left, all three pieces of art in the same place, and a big gray area down at the bottom. That is the worst of the worst. There's no question about that. That's the worst of the worst. Uh, but I don't think that F, uh, the one that I marked F, I definitely do not think is better than 
than uh, C up here, which they considered very bad. Uh, this is terrible because the, your big art is the very is at the bottom of the page. You have you still have two pieces of art together up to the upper left, and then you have your biggest art at the bottom, where you don't want your biggest art at the bottom. And so, F is not much better than G in my book. No, I don't understand where the authors came up with their 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 comparisons. I think they're crazy. Um, They've been drinking too much tonight before they did this page, I think. But uh, the one in the, the right, I think, is one of the best ones. It's not a true triangle, but you've separated all the art from each other. So you have a piece of art on the upper right, a small piece of art. You have your center focus and, uh, towards the top, and then you have your uh, uh, other art in the lower left. It's not much of a triangle, but you've separated and your eyes will go uh, and then the big piece of art is right in the center of the page, so it's well positioned right in the center. You do have some piece of art in all four quadrants. And so while it's not a triangle per se, you have art in all four quadrants, except maybe you could say the lower right. There, there is a little weakness in no art in the lower right, um, except uh, this little box here, kind of uh, in the, the lower in the right right, is also a piece of art. It's text, but it's boxed, and it's and it's uh, uh, it's basically some extra kind of statistics sort of stuff in that little box. Uh, it 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 does represent some graphic impact. So in that sense, you do have some art in the lower right as well with that uh, with that graphic box. So in adding it all up. Um, Actually, the one there, because of that graphic box, that does do away with that uh, gray area on the right. So uh, I'm, B, to me, the second best of all these is the one on the lower right. They also thought it was pretty good. And that was, they were just doing one line at a time, so they weren't comparing all of them. They were doing bad, bad, better, and best is what they were doing. And I totally disagree with them. And I feel very strongly about it, if you can tell. Um, and so I think uh, the one on the lower right, B, is the second best of all their designs that they're showing here. Um, I think then the one they said was bad in the upper left is, is better than the one that they said is good in the upper right. Uh, just a little bit better, but I think it's a little better by, by separating the... Uh, I'm more concerned about the graphics than the fact that there are two stories side by side because they don't, they don't tombstone. In fact, they don't tombstone... It doesn't bother me as much that they're side by side. Uh, so I think the uh, one in the upper left is fine. I say that that's my third best. And then I go to the one in the upper right, D, as my fourth best. And then back to the center one as my fifth best. And then the two of the, two of the bottom, the F and G, are terrible, both terrible. Uh, they're, to me, that's, I don't know how in the world they could say that F is a lot better than G, they're both terrible, um, especially compared to the ones in the top row. Uh, having the center focus at the bottom is not a good thing. And grouping your art together is not a good thing. So I'm disagreeing with these authors, um, and you need to know my preference in these and why I prefer them, why I prefer them. To me, the most important thing in laying out a page is the, is the art. Because that's what your eyes are going to be attracted to. It's going to look at that art. And, uh, <clears throat> and so when you start grouping art, that's to me a mortal sin and uh, one that they didn't mind committing uh, up in the upper, uh, upper right. Um, they didn't have a problem with that, which I disagree with. Um, they got hung up with two columns of two stories next to each other. Not exactly next to each other, but kind of next to each other which I don't understand there. Again, it's not my preferred way. I would put this story to the right and slide this over. Yeah, I would do that. And guess what happens when you do that? You pretty much create the one they have in the front. A. A is, what they consider the bad one, the only difference is this story is over here. That's, that's the difference between what they said was the bad one among the top three is where this story is at. 
this story was over here, and all they said was bad. So in order to get the best one, which they must surely think this is the best one, because they, they, this is the one they made big, they just moved from here to here, and it is the best one. They did divide, put those, separate those stories, did center the, the big art, but again, look, this is the best one, and the one in the upper left, they said, was one of the worst ones. I don't think so. It, it's not as good as the one, it's not as good as A, but it, by their delineation, it would be like, uh, like F, basically. They would say this is F. I don't see it. Uh, a and F? No, 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 no. I don't think so. So I, I don't understand what they're looking at, what they're drinking when they did this. Um, I think uh, the one in the upper left is a pretty good layout. And again, just not that much different than, oops, not that much different than this one, except they slid that story over to the right. And, and it is, does make it better, I totally agree, it is better. This is the best one, I totally agree. But it's not that different from, the, from, from C, which they considered one of the worst ones. So, I don't know. So, understand my, why I do it. I'm looking more at the art than I am the stories. I do want to avoid tombstoning. But C, for example, it has no tomb, uh, if there's no tombstoning in C. So there's no tombstoning of stories, and then the art is separated. So I think it's actually one of the better, better ones that they said was one of the worst ones, and I do not comprehend that at all. Here's some more um, modern designs, big art, big text in some cases. Um, things that will attract people's attention. Obviously, the, uh, this one here does not have a gold triangle, uh, but they, the art is so big, I mean, it's basically, I mean, it's a totally different type of animal uh, with that. So you're, you're making the whole page very, very graphic, and you have a very big, big photo to carry the page. Uh, it's, uh, you don't start worrying, you don't worry about the golden triangle. When you get, uh, when we have the presentation uh, of the, the modern design by uh, the, the, uh, the European modern design that a university put out that some of you are, are assigned to present, um, you'll see some other options besides the golden triangle. And in essence, this is one of them. Uh, even the top one, the upper left one is, is uh, Again, there's no golden triangle with that, but the, the main photo is so big, and the headline's so big that they're, you know, they're dominating the page. You don't need to, when you have that much uh, art, that big of art on the front page, then the golden triangle kind of goes out the door. In our broadsheet, and I'm going to, I think I'm going to, uh, at least, I think I'm going to require this. I'm going to give you enough stories so you can put six stories on the front page of your broadsheet. That's what we tried to do at the newspaper, at the daily paper I was at, six stories on the front page. It was a challenge, and that's why I'm gonna have you do it. It's a challenge to put six stories on a front page. And it does mean some will have to jump. And so the jump stories, you, you can j then, all you have to do is jump some stories to the next page. Uh, it doesn't have to, you don't have to fill the second page, just jump whatever stories you think have to be jumped. Um, but, uh, I want it to be a little more challenging. This one here has uh, one, two, three, four stories plus a lot of plugger type items on the front page. Uh, this one obviously has maybe two. Uh, I can't really read it. It's like a main story and a sidebar about the same subject. Uh, upper right, we have one, two, three, four stories plus a lot of, uh, well, I guess five stories. That's the story there too. Plus a lot of pluggers. One in the, uh, here in the, the upper left, we have only three stories, plus a standalone photo, or I mean, actually it's a plugger photo, it's a big photo, but it's referring into a story inside. So it's kind of like starting that story on the front page, in a way, by having a big piece of art and saying, see the whole story someplace else. Um, I suppose I might be able to be talked into going to five stories. Um, 
in order to give you a little more flexibility, but I want you to have the challenge of having to put, I don't want to, I'm not going to just give you three stories for the front. I, I want, to, uh, and four, actually having even numbers makes it harder than having odd numbers. And with a tat, with a full size page, you can handle five pretty easy. So I'll probably give you five stories. Make it a little bit easier than six and not as much uh, not need to jump stories. I can't see this very well on my computer. One reason why I'm going over to the slides is my computer, the text in here is so small. Uh, I'll go to this slide. Uh, this, by the way, would be a pull-out quote. This makes it a good, nice piece of art. Here are the lo this, uh, this box on the right. They would typically, uh, if it's, uh, they, you know, quote marks, they don't say who said it. Uh, so it would seem to be a pull-out quote where you only have one source in the story. Uh, I would always put the name of the of who said whatever is in quotes here, uh, but that's a way of creating a graphic uh, out of text. Uh, put some color on it, put some quote marks. This is one design of a pull-out quote. But we use shadow boxes in ours uh, a lot of times. Um, okay, so. Anyway, the question is here on this page is make, how do you make the stories fit? Uh, so there's some ideas uh, where you're planning it. I do, I do suggest you don't just go to the, the, to the computer that you just take out a plain sheet of paper if you need to and say, okay, this is my page. Um, where would I put the stories on this? If I have five stories, what am I going to do with them? And just very quickly rough it out. You're, you're allowed to jump some of the stories onto page two. And so rough it out in a sheet with a pen or pencil real fast, kind of give yourself an idea. What do I want to, what's the impact I want to have here? Uh, evaluate the stories. What's the most important story? That one should be towards the top probably. But it may be, it may be, uh, may not be your very top story depending on your best art. You need your best art towards the top. Remember how we want the big piece of art to the top. So, there are different ways of designing around that. You could have, for example, your main story could be right, go all the way across the top with a big headline, even if you have no art or a pull-out quote or a mug or something on your top story. Not, no art, at, almost no art at all with your top story. But make it very thin, all the way across, but very thin with a big headline. And then you have your big piece of art underneath it with a second, with a more of a feature story perhaps, and a big piece of art underneath it, maybe the story boxed, and so in a six column format, you might have one story going across the top with almost no art, but very thin across the top. Then a big piece of art underneath it uh, that's carrying the page and its story underneath the, the story that goes with that art comes underneath it, underneath that photo. And then maybe a one column story down the right, the right column underneath the top story, but, but starting right below it, one column down the, down the right. So your big piece of art is five columns wide uh, and, a, and a headline below that hit that uh, that big piece of art um, kind of like let me go back again what do it compare to um, well on this page it would compare well probably compare best with this um, this uh, I'm presuming that this photo goes with the Mitchell Homer sinks Dodgers because that would make it uh, uh, would make it uh, modular, and so uh, it should it should not be go with any of the other stories. This photo here should be uh, go with the story below it, uh, and if necessary, if there's any confusion, it should be boxed the whole thing. But you see, the top story is fairly thin. Now, in this case, it's going only five columns. Uh, across the top, big headline, almost no art. In fact, there is no art other than a little graphic box there with that top story in this design. But you have the big story underneath it with the big piece of art. So uh, the, the, perhaps they're saying in essence that the top story is the most important, but we had, didn't have good art with it. But we did have good art with, this, with the secondary story, so we're going to put the big art underneath the top story and we're going to put the story, the, the story that goes with it underneath that, that, that the big photo. They did put a one column story to the right of it. So this, the story and photo in the center is four columns and a broad sheet. Uh, you do have that, in order to break up the gray at the top, they do have a photo 
uh, up on the upper left and a one column uh, story coming down down the side there. But this is, so this is a way of, so in this page they do have one, two, three, four, five stories plus uh, a, a graphic box, a standalone graphic box. So again, this, uh, and by the way, even in this one, and think about it, I might slide this over here and this over here, um, or or do what, uh, or put the graphic box over here. Here you have a graphic box right next to the photo, so you do have two graphic impacts right next to each other. It could also be divided, by the way. Um, so that one I'm not saying is perfect either, but I do think it's probably the best. Um, Anyway, so that's kind of what I was talking about is on a five column format or a five story, uh, a six column, but five stories on a front page. That kind of looks like, you know, a good design for that where you do not have a good piece of art with your top story. So you're saying the most important story goes to the top, but it does not have any art at all. We've designed the art around it because the, the reporter didn't do a good job of getting us some art, but they gave us a good story. So we went the story at the top, the big photo that, that carries the page is actually with a second, uh, second or even maybe even third best story, uh, but we, it has good art. So we wrap around that, that good art that they brought in with a, with a lower rank story. But you have to decide how to rank your stories um, and then how to rank your art and how to work around, work them together. What's my best story? What's my best art? How am I going to fit this, uh, create a design that makes sense here? And then you rough it out, and then you create it on desktop publishing. Anyway, going back to making stories fit, uh, the size of your art, you can adjust the size of your art. You can put in a, uh, a quote box like you see here in the lower right. Um, you can put in a subheadline if you have if you have uh, don't have enough story to fill the space that you designed it for. Put in a a, a good head, subheadline. Uh, so a subheadline, a pullout quote, uh, a, a mugshot. You know that you can fill up a, a space fairly quickly. Sometimes we would do a pullout quote with a photo part of that package. So a a a box pullout quote and next to it a mugshot uh, that went with the. Uh, the who said the, you know, whoever said the quote. And so we made it into a bigger deal, uh, a bigger graphic piece of graphic by having a, a photo in with the pullout quote. And, uh, and so you can actually make that pretty good size and, and make it, give it quite a bit of graphic impact with a pullout quote. Uh, there's other minor things like references in to an associated, to a, a related story on another page. Uh, you will be working individually enough that you may not have that as much of an option. Um, just the way you do the headline. If we go back, you remember if you're using a, uh, a hammerhead, for example, hammerhead will take a lot more space than will a regular headline. So you use a hammerhead, you're, you're leaving a lot of white space, and with a big subheadline underneath the hammer, uh, then that takes up more space. So as you start designing, you start learning these little tricks uh, and incorporating them to fill the space as necessary. It's usually a bigger problem of having too much text as usual, but there are times when you run out when you find you have not enough text, and so you start, again, doing pull-out quotes, stuff like that, to make them work. Uh, this is called, this is your center spread or your double truck. None of you will have this as an assignment, but just for your information, as you pull out a, uh, a newspaper right in the very center, the very center two pages of that section is your double truck. And so you have two pages right next to each other that are printed right next to each other. And because they're printed right next to each other in the, in the press, you can actually go right across. You don't have to have a gutter. You can go right across the gutter. And so you see that's what they've done here in this double truck. Is you don't, you don't, these are two pages next to each other and you don't see where the center's at. They probably tried to avoid, well, actually this is probably the center right here. They have left a little extra space there because you don't want to put text across the center, the center, but you can put art across it. 
So in this case, they put art right across the center spread, and down here, that Saturn came across the center spread. The headline went across the center, the gutter, I mean. So Saturn, you know, the, in both of them, they have some stuff across the gutter that's in the middle, middle but not text. They didn't, don't, they don't, you don't want to put text uh, on the gutter on the, the, where you normally have space for it to fold and so forth, but where you have two pages right next to each other, you can make, it, make a really nice design, a two-page design like you see here, um, but you won't have that assignment. Uh, graphics, uh, I mentioned before, some of you could, with your stories, come up with graphics rather than photographs. And there's some examples you can make. Uh, uh, even Excel will give you a pretty, some pretty good graphics uh, that you could use uh, uh, with a story. Well, there's some other things that we're running out of time. I don't think I'll bother. One thing it's showing here is be careful um, about how you position stories. Like this headline underneath the former vice president, Vice President Cheney visits new grandchild right next to it is this monkey. Um, the positioning of your stories can be outrageous. Uh, I doubt you'll have that sort of problem in your assignments, but be very careful in the real world. You do not want uh, a, a layout like this where you have, where you're kind of suggesting that the monkey is his grandchild. Um, and that is possible to do, uh, it's, and it could get you fired, so don't do it, especially if that person is very powerful. They're not going to be happy about it. Oh, I will cover this real quick before uh, cropping. Let me just cover this and we'll end. Uh, which is the better photo here? Which of these uh, crops, which of these cropped, you know, this is all one photo, three croppings of the same photo. Which one's best? You may want to give me your opinion. Which of these photos is best? We're out of time. If you want to go, if you want to leave, you got to answer the question. Which one's best? Upper right. Okay. How many think the upper right's best? Nobody. Uh, how about the one on the left? Who thinks the one on the left is best? Okay, quite a few people. How many think the one on the lower right is best? Nobody again. Again, let's go to the one on the upper right. How many think the upper right's the best? Nobody voted the last time. A whole bunch of you didn't vote for any of them. Uh, actually, I show this to suggest that any of them could be right depending on what you're trying to do. What are you trying to emphasize with this, with this photo? How big do you want it? Do you want to, the one on the left shows more kind of the environment. And so this would be like the professor standing in front of one of the buildings. You, you show the environment or standing in front of the lake or whatever. You're trying to show the environment along with that. But is that always the best photo of, a, of the professor that you're doing the story about? No. You're not going to do all your photos that way. And so sometimes you want to get a little bit closer. And so now you're having him teaching in class, and he's talking, and he's all enthusiastic about what he's talking about. Uh, well, now that's a, maybe a better photo for some purposes. And so all of these have their, their point. The one on the lower right obviously emphasizes the emotion in his face. Is that what you want to emphasize? So you can take a photo, and if you have good quality, you can make any of these three out of it. Depending on what you're trying to accomplish, they're good photos. Uh, a lot of variety between those. So we're out of time, uh, uh, so I'll just stop there. Be careful, I guess, just looking at the next one. Be careful how you crop. Don't crop off people's feet. Do crop something, uh, if you have dead space, crop it out. Uh, the center one is the right crop. The one on the right, you're cropping out feet. You don't want to do that, it looks very strange when you crop people's feet off, or crop their hands off, something like that. You look like some sort of a sadist or something. Um, so crop like the center one. You want it to, uh, you want to kill, get rid of the dead space, but you don't want to excessively crop. But again, what do you mean by excessively crop? I mean, obviously, we're not showing his feet in the lower right. We're showing his, we're, we're emphasizing shoulders, head and shoulders. His hand, we didn't crop off his hands. Um, so the lower right is fine. You cropped out a bunch of stuff to emphasize the emotion in his face. 
in that case. So same sort of thing. Okay, well, we're out of here. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll go out in the hall out here if you need me, but we need to stop.